Hi, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a talk mostly on perturbation theory of Lindbladians with multiple steady states. Uh, for that project, um, I'm still collaborating. This is an ongoing work collaborating with my uh, advisor, previous advisor uh, at Yale, Liang Zheng, uh, his student Kyung Ju, Florentin Ryder at Harvard, and uh, Zlatko Minov also at Yale. The first half will consist about, will, will be a summary of um, some of the previous work uh, that, that we've done in that direction as well. So I don't need to motivate to this audience too much, but if you take a, some big system and environment, select the degrees of freedom you want to uh, accurately describe and trace out the remaining degrees of freedom, you will get an evolution that is non-unitary. If you furthermore make some, um, or some, uh, quite a lot of approximations, uh, not to model every single system out in the world, but to distill the simplest possible non-trivial extension of a Hamiltonian-based evolution, you get a Lindbladian. This super operator L consists of two, two pieces, basically. The von Neumann equation corresponding to the Hamiltonian um, piece of the system. And this new piece corresponding uh, or stemming from the environment consisting of jump operators F. Uh, this piece in turn can be split into two parts, one corresponding to a deterministic term governing uh, sort of a non Hermitian Hamiltonian evolution. Um, the reason I say that is because it acts from only one side at a time. And the remaining term, the jump term, acts from both sides at the same time and is the reason you can't write this equation as acting on a cat only. Is anyone else noticing a vibration? No? Okay. It's not on purpose. It's good vibration. <laughs> so uh, you may be familiar with, uh, from, with this equation from 1976 by GKSL. Um, the Russians did it first. As as often can, can happen. In fact, they even said it is not difficult to generalize a single jump operator uh, master equation to one involving more than one jump operator. Uh, but in fact, even though they wrote it down, they didn't prove that uh, this evolution is uh, completely positive and trace preserving. That was done nine, eight years later in 1976. There's an a good paper about the history of this. Um, so, a Lindbladian can have, or generically has a unique steady state. Um, we've seen talks about trying to reserve our engineer Lindbladians to stabilize exotic states, your favorite phase, etc. cetera. Um, this is clearly useful for quantum simulation. I want to switch gears and focus on Lindbladians that have multiple steady states. This is not a generic example, not, not generic, uh, but it's a nice extension of Hamiltonians that have multiple ground states. And the point is, the, the point of what I was trying to, to, to study was to see uh, what things, what information about Hamiltonians with multiple ground states can be extended to Lindbladians with multiple steady states. For obvious reasons, such Lindbladians are useful for quantum computing. You can think of the steady states as uh, storing quantum information, and you want to, say, protect or, and or manipulate that information inside this uh, steady state space. Um, one type of simple steady state space is a decoherence free subspace, and that's the one I'll be focused for simplicity for the, throughout this talk, although um, a lot of the results hold for more general or the most general class of steady state spaces. Okay, so a little bit of math. Anyone into open quantum systems quickly figures out that you have to divide your space into four parts, the space of operators into four pieces, uh, whenever you have decay. So this is what we do. So if we have this DFS, it's, a, uh, it's, this, it's this upper left corner that is uh, evolving unitarily under the Lindbladian. Let's say it's just steady, so the unitary evolution is trivial. So in other words, the Lindbladian isn't touching this corner at all. Um, when we ha and, and in non-trivial cases, we'll have another space here, the lower right corner, 
which corresponds to populations and coherences decaying under the evolution of the Lindblad. So you can think of this as a few ground states and this is some excited state subspace. And what's unique about this type of evolution, which, which is what you, you, you do not have this in Hamiltonians, is that populations here somehow wind up decaying and going over here because you're trace preserving. And that part of decay of populations from these states into these states is what basically the first half of this talk is about. So that's why this is called the decaying subspace. And of course the other two uh, subspaces, matrix subspaces, are, uh, consist of coherences between a state in the DFS and a state out in the decaying subspace. So just to contrast this with your generic Lindbladian with a unique steady state, if I were to write that in uh, some Gibbs uh, Davies map steady state um, in this language, then this point would be moved all the way to the corner and there would be no multiple steady states here. It would just be one, one unique state that takes up whose rank is the same as the dimension of the system. This is not what we're going to study here. This is what we're going to study. Uh, a nice example that you'll hear about, I think, later in this conference is uh, uh, the two-cap pump. So you can imagine sort of a two-well a two system uh, in an oscillator, just one bosonic mode, um, whose Lindbladian uh, stabilizes the steady states, coherent states alpha and uh, minus alpha. And alpha is sufficiently large, so these two things are very separated in phase space. And that's what we'll assume our upper uh, left block to be outer products of alpha and minus alpha coherent states. Um, the decaying subspace will be everything else in phase space with the exception of coherences between some, one, of the, one of the states in the, in the DFS and some other state that's perpendicular to it. So keep this example in mind when we go through some of the, some of the, der or the results. So we can be a little bit more technical about this and actually define projections that cut out each of the four corners of the Hilbert space. And these, sup these are super operator projections that are labeled graphically as such. They consist of operator projections, P and Q, um, acting either from the left or from the right. And uh, P is just the all ones here and zeros here. And Q is just all ones here and zeros here. For the cat case, P is just the projection onto the DFS. Q is just the orthogonal complement. So armed with that extra uh, tools, uh, we'll study what happens when states uh, undergo Lindbladian evolution in the infinite time limit. So this is something that always happens for all Lindbladians. Uh, an initial density matrix rho in initial under evolution uh, generated by the Lindbladian in the infinite time limit goes to some asymptotic or infinite time state rho infinity which is related to the initial state by a superoperator projection, uh, P infinity. This is another projection that's not, not yet, it's not equal to those projections that I had in the previous slide. Uh, mathematically, this is just the uh, projection on the left and right kernel of L. Physically, it's a quantum channel mapping initial states to final states, yes? I'm going to do finite dimensional matrices. Uh, but, but if I had a Hamiltonian. Oh, yes, sorry. That's, that's correct. I think I didn't, wasn't clear. Uh, this is a case when you don't have any residual unitary evolution. In the general, most, most general case, you're going to have an e to the t h superoperator infinity here. You'll have always some spinning afterward. But for simplicity, I'm ignoring that. Um, right. So graphically, uh, the cases I'm considering uh, here, you have these three pieces and, and, and things wind up going over here in the infinite time limit. Okay. So when the steady state is unique, this is pretty trivial. This just, tra this just uh, takes the trace of rho in and then spits out a state rho infinity that's unique. But we're not interested in that. Um, when there's more than one steady state, it's a little bit trickier to figure out uh, what's going on. But in general, there's going to be a dependence on where you, uh, on, on where you start. Um, sorry, the, where you go will depend on where you start. So when you have more than one place to go to in the steady state space, 
you can start in different places in the full space and go to different points in the steady state space. So there is a dependence on initial conditions. I don't confuse, don't confuse this with the fact that Lindbladians are Markovian. That's still true, but uh, there is dependence on the, of the final state on initial condition for uh, such a Lindbladian that we're considering here. So what, what basically one of the, one of the results is uh, a formula for P infinity in terms of those projections that we discussed last time. So, and also the Lindbladian itself. And uh, here's the formula. It consists of two pieces. The first piece should be um, the obvious one. It just says that if you start in the DFS, you stay there. So this piece covers anything that already is in the DFS. It just acts as identity and doesn't touch anything. Um, but remember that this P infinity, is, is, that's not everything that P infinity does. P infinity also has to make sure that populations in the decaying space somehow manage to go over into the DFS because otherwise the map, the Lindbladian won't be trace preserving. And that's what the second piece does. Um, the second piece, you notice, starts acting on populations and coherences in the lower right block and then through some resolvent or Green's function and, and a transfer term here moves them over into the upper left block. So this makes sure that this map is actually CPTP. Um, right, so, you know, okay, it's an analytical formula, but you still have to take an inverse. So, uh, you know, it's still a bit hard to calculate even though it's, it's been proven. Um, Okay, so maybe we can look at a f just a few examples um, of what this formula uh, reveals. Um, namely, I just copied it here, and now you notice there's only two terms, one acting on the upper left, one acting on the lower right. Uh, and there's no term acting on the off-diagonal coherences. Okay? Um, so coherences, any, if you start, if your initial state has any sort of coherences, um, in between uh, the, steady, the DFS and outside of the DFS, those completely disappear in the infinite time limit. You can sort of think of that as a, as a measurement that the system performs um, where it measures that you to be either in the DFS or outside with the additional step of then taking everything that's outside into the DFS. So, as a, so this, this holds in general for all types of systems like this and, and more general thing, structures that can, that can occur here. Uh, you can imagine poking holes in this big red square. Um, so for the two-cat pump, uh, we can demonstrate this effect by starting in an initial state uh, and going and seeing what happens when you go in the infinite time limit. So let's start in this uh, initial state as follows. So this is just a crude Wigner function sketch of this state. Uh, we're going to start in a state that uh, a linear superposition of coherent states, one at alpha, which is already in the, in the red block in the DFS, and one at some beta that's far away from this other minus alpha DFS piece. Um, so the sketch shows that this superposition is quantum because you have these uh, red and blue fringes that uh, occur between these two states. So this is a cat state. Um, right, so we start in this cat state and now we turn on the Lindbladian and go to the infinite time limit. Because of this formula, we don't need to calculate any intermediate time behavior and just straight, uh, you know, perform this, this calculation and get exactly what, we're, uh, what, what the infinite time uh, state is. And in infinite time, it turns out that you can sort of see it. This is a double, pseudo double well system. This piece just goes over here. But these fringes have disappeared. Okay, so why is that? Well, that's because uh, these fringes are exactly in these off-diagonal pieces. Remember, this state is in the upper left and this state is in the lower right. So the, the coherences between these two blobs have to be in the off-diagonal and those disappear. If, on the other hand, you start in a different type of cat state that where both of the black circles are outside of the DFS, then it may or may not be possible to preserve coherences in here to go into here. Um, and in this case, due to symmetry, it actually is possible. Uh, and what you wind up in the infinite time limit is this state with the coherences preserved. And the symmetry that I mentioned here is the parity symmetry. Okay, so now let's maybe switch gears, or definitely switch gears, and focus on perturbation theory. So before we were considering initial states outside of the red box and moving them into the box. Now we're going to uh, start with states that are already in the box. So the initial state is already steady. 
Okay, it's evolved and we, we've assumed pure initialization, perfect initialization, it's a pure state. It's our initial quantum uh, computation and we want to manipulate it. And we're going to manipulate it using perturbation theory. Um, and so we're going to consider the effect of a perturbation, O, on a system governed by Lindblattian L. And the key here is that L has multiple steady states. So L has this type of uh, structure where there's anything in the cube is preserved by L uh, and doesn't evolve. And we're going to perturb with a perturbation O and some ramp up, ramp up function G of T that I'll go into detail a little bit later. So again, we assume the initial state is steady. Given this assumption, we can go further and derive some interesting perturbation theory properties. So first is uh, a simple formula for the first order correction uh, due to the, of, of the system state due to the perturbation O. This is basically the Kubo formula for closed systems, but in this superoperator notation, it makes, uh, this superoperator notation makes it quite easy to read from right to left. So let's do that. So remember, we started with an initially steady state rho infinity. Um, we, evolve, we perturb with the perturbation at time tau. We then evolve under the non-perturbed Lindblattian from time tau to time t. And then we sum up over all possible times tau that the perturbation could act on the system. Okay, so this is exact. Um, and uh, now if we further start making some assumptions on what g of tau is, we can solve these, we can evaluate these integrals. So if we assume a slowly ramping up uh, g of t and then partition the space into our red cube and everything outside the red cube using the p infinity projection that I just described to you, then we can split, we can solve this integral we can, we, and we can split it into two pieces. Uh, one that acts within the, the, sorry, this should be the DFS, more generally the asymptotic subspace. Um, but yeah, within the DFS, so within this red cube, and one governing leakage outside of the DFS. So just to clarify, I'm not considering the full steady state space of this full system. I am just considering partitioning into the steady state space of this one and seeing what the perturbation does with respect to that partition, namely does the perturbation, what, what, what happens within that red cube and, and how does the perturbation take you outside of it, okay? So that's within is the red term and outside is the blue term. Um, so anyway, solving these, these, this integral, splitting it into two, we get two pieces. This should remind you of degenerate perturbation theory. Remember for Hamiltonian, you have PHP where P is the projection, or sorry, PVP where V is the perturbation and P is the projection onto the states of interest. Uh, this is just the superoperator version of that using P infinity, the proper projection you need to use for open system perturbation theory. Um, so nothing trivial, nothing non-trivial yet. Uh, the second piece is uh, sort of the wave function correction, the generalization of the wave function correction. Remember, in the correction of the wave function, you have an energy denominator um, of consisting of energy differences between the, the state you're interested in and all the other states. And here you have an energy denominator consisting of the ener energy uh, of the steady state, which is zero, and all the other states, which is some complex number with non-negative real part. And namely, this is the Green's function. The, and it's a pseudo-inverse. Uh, it's not the more Penrose pseudo-inverse, important. It's, it's, the, it's, it's a different type of pseudo-inverse. You can ask me about it later. But it's basically a generalization of the Green's function to open systems. Um, so if you consider Berry phases and adiabatic limits, uh, you have a similar type of distinction in, into two types of terms that I won't discuss for the sake of time. Okay, so red term and blue term. This, is, this keeps you inside the steady state space because you have a P infinity acting from the left and this takes you out because you have this resolvent that acts trivially on the red cube and so it has to, act, it has to take you outside. <coughs> Um, notice the time coefficient next to these two pieces is different. This is first order in time, this is second. So even though you're f both terms are first order in the perturbation, one of them has a different order in time. Let's keep that in mind for later. Okay, so now let's plug in particular classes of perturbations and see how these things uh, simplify. The perturbations we can consider are Hamiltonian perturbations. 
um, adiabatic kicks in some parameter space, assuming the Lindblatian is dependent on some parameters, and jump operator perturbations. So say L has jump operators F, and you perturb them, each of them with some little f. These two perturbation classes, um, the results we're gonna, are going to be here also hold for these two, but we're not going to describe them. We'll just focus on Hamiltonian perturbations. So uh, we have this POP, but we know what P infinity looks like. We have those squares we can use, so we can do some square math. Um, the square projections onto the four corners are orthogonal, so uh, after a few calculations plugging into the form of P and seeing how O acts on uh, the state, the initially steady state, you can show that uh, P infinity O P infinity is just O projected onto the upper left. So this should not be unexpected uh, because the Hamiltonian perturbation uh, to the DFS, the effect of it should just be the projection of the Hamiltonian onto the, just the DFS. Um, this is not trivial to show from here. You need the, one of the ways to show it is to show, is to have this form for P infinity and this is what we did. But it should be intuitive that this is true. Um, this also holds uh, in the same spirit for these types of perturbations, but it does not hold for other types of perturbations. For example, if O is of Lindblad type, is, is a Lindblad perturbation, then um, this, this part does not hold. Uh, this, the reason for this is that if O is Lindblad, it has pieces that act from both sides at the same time, meaning, and, and that means that your upper left block can be mapped into the lower right block. And uh, P infinity has some presence on the lower right block, and then that piece starts to come in, and then you have a totally different effect. But if you're Hamiltonian, then uh, you remove that piece completely, and you just have everything happening in the upper right, upper left. Um, for the two-cat pump and a Hamiltonian perturbation, let's consider that example. Uh, and uh, we can consider starting with some initially steady state that has some particular superposition with some phase of, of, of the two states alpha and minus alpha. Uh, and now we can consider perturbing. So O, V is just some driving field that drives you up. And in a, in a, in a limit where this term, the red term, dominates over the blue term, we get effective unitary evolution um, within the steady state subspace generated by this piece which is just V projected onto the, the cat state subspace. And that evolution winds up actually uh, simulating a, a rotation in the block sphere of the two co coherent states, and it winds up moving you um, to a different superposition with a different phase, namely this is red and, and this is blue. And this was actually experimentally demonstrated at Yale not too long ago. <coughs> so to summarize <coughs> regarding the red term, for the type of steady state space that we consider here, the effect of Hamiltonian perturbations, jump operator perturbations, and adiabatic evolution within a subspace of states is the same regardless of whether the subspace is a decoherence-free subspace of a Lindbladian or a degenerate ground state subspace of a Hamiltonian. So whatever you intuition you have from degenerate uh, ground state subspaces of Hamiltonians can be extended here with respect to these things. Okay, now let's look at the blue term. So we've, we've narrowed down which squares participate in the red term. Now the blue term, it turns out we can erase a square as well. Um, because, so because O is assumed to be Hamiltonian for this slide, um, I remember I said that um, it only acts on, from one side or the other side on, on the system, and so it cannot map you to this lower right block. Which that implies that the piece of L inverse that's relevant to this order in the perturbation is, is only uh, the off-diagonal pieces because the lower right block simply doesn't touch, isn't touched by O, and the upper left block is trivial because we've assumed L doesn't act on that upper left block at all. So, so it, right, so the, the gap, the dissipative gap that's relevant here is only the gap associated with these pieces and not the lower right. Moreover, in some cases, that gap can be, uh, the gap in the up, off diagonal uh, sub subspace can be related to the gap of a Hamiltonian. For the two-cat pump, this is actually true. Um, 
And it's true, so, so the Hamiltonian in question is as follows. Um, the jump operator for the two cat pump is this. This is the lowering operator. This F, you should be able to see that it annihilates coherent states alpha and minus alpha because it, there's a two here, so it doesn't care about the sign. And the Hamiltonian that, that the, whose excitation gap is the gap of this off diagonal piece is just F dagger F, okay? And here is the number operator A dagger A. So in, in, in first order, you can relegate your problem of finding the gap of a Lindblattian to a gap of a Hamiltonian for, for these types of DFS uh, type of jump operator uh, systems. And uh, if we plot all the gaps that we, we, we care about, so the blue line is the gap of the off diagonal piece. This other part has the same gap. Um, the red part is the gap of the lower right piece. And the black dots are the minimum of the two, which is the gap of the whole system. We see that sometimes the blue part is the smallest, and sometimes the red part is the smallest. And we see that in this region here, the blue part is bigger, which is good, because that means the system is more stable to, to leakage than uh, it, we had originally thought, because we can ignore this lower right part. Okay. Okay. So. I guess I wouldn't be a physicist if I didn't sweep an infinity under the carpet, which is actually what I wound up doing. So let's go back and uh, focus on that a little bit. So remember, we started with this integral. We were able to cook up some g of t that was allowed us to solve this and cut it into two pieces, a red part and a blue part. Um, so the, one, and the, the way we did it was actually a slowly ramping up evolution. So we started at negative infinity time, and we exponentially wrapped up to time equals zero, and then we just let it, let it stay there at, at one uh, for positive times. And the ramp up that we did uh, was in the limit that it was very, very slow. So in the perfect limit, it just winds up co being constant the whole time. And uh, that leads to an infinity, because if you're slowly ramping up for, from negative infinity to zero time, you're going to be evolving that whole time. And if you say, or within the steady state subspace, you'll, you'll acquire some big phase in that, uh, in that limit. This happens for unitary evolution as well if you do this type of thing. So in scattering, and they do this. Um, and and that's, that's this term. So remember, 8 is going to 0, and so it's an infinity that I didn't point out before, which I'm pointing out now, to be fair. Uh, we had just removed it before. So that's a side effect of this type of evolution. It allows you to solve the integrals. But you get this infinity, which was perfectly sensible, and, and we can just remove it. If we do it a different way, if we now assume the more proper physical sudden ramp up, where you just have a step function at time zero, and then you just leave it on, leave the perturbation on, then we, we have, this also has its advantages and disadvantages. If to first order, this is what you get. Um, and here you get another term that I didn't show, is, and, and that's a term that, that's a ring down term that's a result of the suddenness of the perturbation. Okay, and this term actually is is more problematic in my opinion than this infinity, uh, because it doesn't it prohibits you from being able to solve this equation to higher order. This is only first order. We want to say go to higher order. Um, so, right. So, it turns out that this we were able to extend to higher orders, and this is a bit trickier because of this ring down term, um, but. You, as you can see, if we remove the green highlighted pieces in both parts, they're equal. So for sufficiently long times, I would wager one over bigger than the dissipative gap. Um, the, the way you start up the perturbation shouldn't matter okay, at sufficiently long time. And that's the hope that we have in trying to validate uh, this extension that, we, that, I'll, that I'll describe in a few slides. Okay, so. Again, this is tricky to extend. This can be extended. And now the point is to try to see how this is related to the actual evolution, which is really starting at time equal to 0 and going to, to positive times. So to recap, for order n equals 1, we had our degenerate uh, wave, wave function and energy term. One is leakage. One is uh, evolution within. We can do the same. We can now have a double integral where you sum over two instances of the perturbation. Uh, we can partition that, and now we get more terms. So the first term that we get is this term, which is just this term, effectively the second order term in the Taylor series of this POP. 
Um, now I'm not assuming anything about the perturbation, by the way, no Hamiltonian or anything, so I'm not doing four, uh, four corners here. Um, we also get this term that this is the first term that winds up first kicking you out with this L inverse and then taking you back in with this P infinity. And uh, yeah, more about that term later. We get, and then we get three more leakage terms. Okay. Um, so this term is interesting because if we assume a unitary perturbation, so if O is Hamiltonian, then this is the first non-unitary correction to the DFS. Um, if you think O is proportional to some frequency omega and L is proportional to some decay rate kappa, this is what you often hear in, in, the, in the literature as or in, the, in talking to people as the omega squared over kappa or omega squared over gamma term. Um, moreover, if anyone's familiar with the effective operator formalism uh, of Florentin, uh, taking this term and making the same assumptions on the structure of the Lindblad and the perturbation that they did in that paper yields the effective operator formalism. They did it via adiabatic um, approximations and uh, here you just do it by straight up second order perturbation theory within the steady state space. Um, now, condensed matter, people might recognize these two terms if you think of L inverse as a Green's function, this is just G O G O, G O G O G O, et cetera. Um, these two terms are special in that if you assume that the unperturbed Lindbladian has just one steady state, so this cube now just shrinks to just one point, uh, then these are the only two terms that remain. And this whole set of seven terms reduces just to two and reduces to previous known work by Koch, uh, Petruccioni, and Andy Lee, where they considered perturbation theory where the unperturbed piece had only one um, steady state. In the degenerate case, right, so, and how do you see that? Well, so in the, in the unique case, PO is zero. So anytime you see an O followed by a P infinity, you remove it, and you can see for yourself that the only time you don't see a PO is in those two terms. But we're doing degenerate perturbation theory, so let's continue. Uh, another interesting remark is that we were scooped by the French 70 years ago for part of this work. Um, Claude Bloch uh, in 1958 derived a diagrammatic uh, series, uh, perturbation series um, for degenerate time independent perturbation theory. And five out of the seven terms you can find in that work, um, these two are not present in time independent perturbation theory and they are simply higher order combinations of, of the terms in the previous order. So you can see this one is just sort of this one squared in some sense and this one is this one times that one. Um, so these two terms are new and that, they're a result of this being a Dyson series of being time dependent perturbation theory rather than time independent perturbation theory where you look at corrections to the eigenstates and the eigenenergies or eigenmatrices in the uh, eigenvalues. Okay, so I mentioned diagrammatics. You can, you can do that here, and now everybody becomes a physicist. So, uh, including your wife, which gives you advice on how to do the right diagrams. So, if you put a dot next to P infinity, uh, every time you have a P infinity, you put a horizontal line every time you have O, and you put a vertical line of length n every time you have an inverse uh, of some power n, um, you can convert these terms into diagrams. So the first term here is just p infinity, o, p infinity, p infinity, o, and then l inverse. Um, and you can, that's the first order parts. You can do this to second order. And now you start seeing connections to interesting things from computer science called the Catalan numbers. So if you rearrange these diagrams, you see that they actually correspond to something in this book. And uh, these numbers, these diagrams are counted by the Catalan numbers. The Catalan numbers, it turns out, count like some 200 some odd sequences of different things in computer science. Uh, so the next thing that they count turns out to be the number of terms in this perturbative expansion where you cut up into red and blue pieces. And there's uh, quite a lot of these Catalan numbers, so they're quite big. Uh, remember, for first order, there's two, second order, there's five, and then you go on and so on and so forth. And remember that if we go to unique steady state case for the unperturbed Lindbladian, we'll have one, 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 one everywhere. 
So this combinatorial blow up is a, is a result of us doing degenerate perturbation theory and assuming multiple steady states for the imperturbable in Bladian. Um, just a sketch of, of some ongoing work of how to do these diagrams. Um, you, for, to order n, so say we have n instances of O, the perturbation, we draw a square um, and we consider things going, lines going from, or grid, we, and we consider paths from this point to this whole line that do not cross this do not cross line. And anything that ends with a horizontal line ends with a p infinity, and this term is red, namely it, it governs evolution within the red block. Anything that ends with a vertical line of some length ends with a resolvent or some power of it, and uh, some, some such as this one, which ends with L minus 2. And that term governs leakage outside of the red block. Right. So, red, right. So, I mentioned briefly that to first order, it doesn't matter how you turn on the perturbation if you look at the evolution at sufficiently long time. Is this true to all orders? We're still looking into it. This is ongoing work. Um, and uh, the first sort of a line of attack that, that I was thinking about was just to do numerics and look at random perturbations to small systems just to see whether we have our head in the right place. Um, so one can consider a decaying three-level system, very simple, where this is the excited state, this is the upper left space, or the red cube, and we just have a jump operator that decays you from here to here. And that's our L, that's our unperturbed system. It has multiple steady states because it has this as the DFS. And then we take that L and we add a small random Hamiltonian perturbation. So a three by three matrix with random entries that's, that are small. Okay, and then we, we, we can average over instances of, of this small random perturbation. Um, and when we do that, we can make a plot of the, some distance between the exact evolution, which is just this, up to some time t, this is the unperturbed piece, this is the perturbation. D the difference between the exact evolution and some approximate evolution to some order in the perturbation theory in our expansion. And the order we consider is up either 1, 2, 3, or 4. This is Hilbert-Schmidt metric. Um, and, and then we can take this difference, which is on this vertical axis, and plot it versus time, t. And uh, remember, this exact evolution is sudden. It starts at time zero and keeps going. And so we do have some ring down terms that are on the order of the dissipative gap of the unperturbed Lindbladian. And then one would hope that you start to approach this expansion that we have. And it seems to be the case, at least for this example, um, you start seeing uh, decay, so lower is better. This difference becomes smaller and smaller. Um, and then to a give up to a certain point where, depending on the order, then it starts to go off again. Um, so this is, at least, seems to be working for this example, and there's ongoing work to see how we can, uh, what rigorous statements we can make. Um, so that's, that's it. Uh, I'll just briefly mention the topics I addressed. Um, we looked at how initial states go into uh, a DFS uh, by looking at how coherences between um, you know, states in the DFS and outside are ignored using the 2CAD pump. Uh, we then assumed an initially steady state and used the Hamiltonian to manipulate it. Um, you can do that, yeah. And you can show that the, that evolution within the steady state, namely the red term to first order, is unitary, or generates unitary evolution. You can do the same thing if you assume you're dependent on some parameters and then adiabatically move in the parameter space and you get a Berry phase or a Berry matrix. Um, we didn't show that, but that evolution is also unitary for basically the same reasons. You can use that type of parameter dependence uh, to generate a, uh, a generalization of the quantum geometric tensor to open systems. We didn't cover that either. Um, we can talk about it later. Uh, then for the blue term, the leakage term, one in general cares only about these three squares and not this one. Uh, for Hamiltonian perturbations because you can't, you simply cannot go to this square if you start in this square due to a Hamiltonian. And this gap is, this should be greater than or equal, sorry. So this gap is the one you should care about to first order and sometimes that's greater than the actual gap of the Lindbladian, which is good. And then we mentioned some ongoing work about the Dyson series uh, for the steady state assuming some slowly ramping up perturbation. 
So with that, I want to thank you for uh, your attention and thank you for the uh, invitation to speak here.